I created TikTok videos that made viewers 82% more likely to follow my profile. And I did it using an ancient storytelling technique. I share all of that and more in today's episode of Nudge. But first, here's a podcast I'd recommend. My First Million is a podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. It is one of my favourite business and marketing podcasts, and I think you'll like it too. It features famous guests like Gary Vee, Steph Smith, and Peter Levels, and shares their secrets for how they made their first million and how you can apply their learnings to capitalise on today's business trends. So go and listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, you are listening to Nudge with me, your host, Phil Agnew. As a child growing up in the UK, I was brought up on a staple of classic British TV shows. Only Fools and Horses, Blue Peter, Mr Bean. Shows that everyone across the country could reference, the ones you'd watch on repeat. But there was one show that I remember the most from my childhood. It was called EastEnders. For those that don't know, EastEnders is one of the longest running shows in the UK with over 6,500 episodes. And it started airing way back in the 1980s. It's a, it's a classic soap opera that follows the lives of people living in the East End of London. There's one particularly noteworthy thing about EastEnders, though. It's not how long it's been running for or who appears in it. It's how it ends. What, what, what do you want me to do? What, chuck him out? Like, you care about Ian Beale? Perhaps his daughter has been murdered, all right? She weren't much older than Laura. Yeah, that didn't stop you sleeping with her, did it? The EastEnders drums, they're kind of iconic, at least in British telly. It didn't take me long, even as a kid watching the show, to realise why the show used this ending. It's obvious, it, it builds suspense, and it leaves viewers on a cliffhanger. You give her a message from me. You tell that bitch that hell will freeze over before she becomes a Mitchell again. See, EastEnders is aired most weekdays, from Monday to Thursday, every week, every month, every year. The producers need viewers to keep coming back to the show, to stay hooked on the storyline, because if they don't, the show can't continue. So they use cliffhangers, endless cliffhangers. Now look, EastEnders is hardly a theatrical classic, The acting, the storylines, the production, it's not particularly impressive. But these cliffhangers, they work, they keep viewers coming back, and they keep viewers hooked. Despite airing four times a week, the show draws in five million viewers per episode. This makes it consistently one of the most watched shows in the UK. So these cliffhangers, leaving people in suspense, they clearly work. It's a powerful storytelling technique. Cliffhangers aren't new. It's not something the EastEnders producers came up with. No, like most effective techniques, this one has been around for thousands of years, if not longer. Some of the well-documented oldest use of cliffhangers are the 1001 Nights stories, also known as Arabian Nights. These were published way back in the Middle Ages. But just like EastEnders, they rely on cliffhangers. Each night in the story ended on a different cliffhanger to keep readers hooked. Perhaps it's no surprise that Arabian Nights is still being told almost 1,500 years after it was first written. Charles Dickens was a cliffhanger pioneer. After finding success with mystery endings to his stories in the 1800s, cliffhangers became a staple part of his work. Famously, Great Expectations was originally published in small segments in a weekly magazine, each short story ending with its own cliffhanger. Now, I think most writers would enviously look back at Dickens' day and wish they could also be a writer at the time when cliffhangers were were novel, were new, were different, because today, cliffhangers are everywhere. Sitcoms and soap operas like Prisoner, Dallas, Dynasty, Cheers, they used cliffhangers show after show, and especially before season endings. Serial films like Flash Gordon, Star Wars and Back to the Future, they used cliffhangers to keep moviegoers hooked. Today, cliffhangers are often dropped before commercial breaks to make sure people don't switch away during the break. And you'll struggle to watch a Netflix series that doesn't contain some sort of cliffhanger to keep you binging episodes. But that's just professionally produced media. The YouTube and TikTok algorithms don't promote videos based on artistic taste or quality. They promote what people decide to watch, and people decide to watch 
cliffhangers. So the content on those sites are littered with with cliffhanger endings. But why? Why do we humans love cliffhangers so much? What is it about them that keeps us hooked, keeps us keeps us wanting to know more? So you think you'd want a story to be complete, to be whole, that you'd want to see the full picture. But this sort of suggests we prefer the incomplete stories. But it's not exactly like that. See, the reason why cliffhangers keep us hooked is due to something called the Zygonik effect. The Zygonik effect is named after Lithuanian-Soviet psychologist Bolna Zygonik. She discovered that activities that have been interrupted and are incomplete are more likely to be remembered and recalled. In other words, incomplete things are more memorable. Zygonik first discovered this at a local beer garden. Sitting with students and research assistants, the conversation turned to the remarkable talent of a veteran waiter who, without keeping any written record, could remember and distribute perfectly the orders of large groups of diners. Zygonik's group, being a group of psychologists, decided to explore the limits of this man's impressive memory. So they came up with a plan. After he had served all of the group members flawlessly, they covered their plates and their glasses with the tablecloth. They then asked him to return to the table and try and again recall what each had ordered. But this time, he couldn't do it. In fact, he couldn't even come close. What accounted for this difference? Sure, a length of time had passed, 30 seconds or so, but that amount of time doesn't drastically affect memory. Instead, Zygonik suspected a different reason. As soon as the waiter correctly placed the last dish in front of the last diner at the table, his task of serving the group changed from being unfinished to finished. Unfinished tasks hoard our attention so they can be performed and dispatched successfully, meaning we quickly forget once a task is complete. Zygonik went on to prove this theory in a set of studies published in 1927. One of the most interesting studies found that students who stopped studying to perform an unrelated activity, such as studying a different subject or even playing a game, students who stopped their studying in the middle of their study session and then did something else and came back to it, would remember material better than students who completed the study sessions without a break. There has been lots of applications of this finding as well, and some are very literal. Ernest Hemingway famously finished every day's writing in the middle of a sentence. Rather than finish his thought, he left it purposely unfinished. He's quoted saying, I learned never to empty the well of my writing, but to always stop when there was something more in the deep part of the well and let it refill at night from the springs that had fed it. He attributed his ability to write effectively each day to basically the Zygonic effect and leaving his sentences unfinished. You'll have seen mobile apps apply this exact same principle in their onboarding design. These apps tell you you're 65% of the way there and do these three steps to complete your profile. There's even an argument that Da Vinci's Mona Lisa supposedly benefits from the Zygonic effect as well because viewers are left unable to determine if Mona Lisa is really smiling and if so, what that signifies and how Da Vinci produced such an expression. These unsolved mysteries draw in our attention and keep our attention. That's why the picture is so memorable. The Zygonic effect also explains why cliffhangers are more memorable. They are incomplete stories, and studies show that incomplete things are easily recalled. But that doesn't explain why cliffhangers are so popular and and why we keep falling for them. Sure, they're memorable, but something memorable wouldn't keep people watching EastEnders day after day. There must be something else to cliffhangers, something unique that makes them so addictive. To understand that, we'll look at the curiosity gap and how I spent $400 on TikTok ads to test this effect out. All of that after this quick 60 second break. Creating great customer experience starts with having a full picture. And having a full picture starts with having teams that are connected. 
HubSpot is, I think, the best platform out there for helping your teams feel more connected. The HubSpot CRM platform is carefully crafted from the ground up, designed to unite your data, apps, and teams in a single, easy-to-use system. So instead of wasting valuable time tracking down information, your teams can spend their time having conversations where it matters most with your customers. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. So, the curiosity gap. That's what makes cliffhangers so alluring. You might not have heard of the curiosity gap, but you've definitely experienced it. It's that desire to seek out missing information. That information could be who's the killer if you're watching a murder mystery, or if you're on Tinder, it could be is my match good looking? That's right, Tinder uses the curiosity gap to convert 8% of their users into paying users. According to this great study by Growth Design, 8% of Tinder users upgrade to gold just to see who has liked their profile. They do this by leveraging the curiosity gap. Tinder doesn't just show you the three people that have already liked you and says, upgrade to see more. They show you blurred images of their faces. You can see a a vague outline of what they look like, (laughs) but you can't see if they're good looking or not. The curiosity gap kicks in and people sign up because they're desperate to see what these potential matches look like. This small nudge works wonders. Tinder gets an 8% conversion rate and on a $20 a month product, that's incredible. It's hardly a surprise they made $1.2 billion last year. But that's not the only example of the curiosity gap in dating. There's one eye-opening study from Presuasion by Robert Cialdini that reveals how anyone can instantly become more attractive. That's right, if you want to appear more attractive, you need to leave certain things about yourself unknown. This set of studies analysed college women's attraction to certain young men. The women participated in an experiment where their profiles had already been analysed by a set of college men. The women would be shown some of their ratings from the men. For example, Brian rated you 8 out of 10. But other ratings from other men were hidden. For example, John's rating can only be shown if you pick him. The researchers wanted to know which male the woman would pick and if this curiosity gap had any impact. Surprisingly, the college women didn't pick the guys who had rated them the highest or the guys who they ranked as most attractive. Instead, they picked the men whose ratings were unknown to the women. During the experiment, the men who kept popping up in the women's minds were the ones whose ratings hadn't been revealed yet, confirming the researchers' hypothesis that when an important outcome is unknown to people, they can hardly think of anything else. But it's not just the dating scene where the curiosity gap calls the shots. As you can imagine, it's in marketing as well. In one set of studies, again cited in Persuasion, participants were asked to watch or listen to television programs that included commercials for soft drinks, mouthwash, and pain relievers. Later, their memory for the commercials was tested. The greatest recall occurred for the details of ads that the researchers had stopped five or six seconds before their natural endings. That's right, people remembered the ads better when they were stopped earlier, when when the latter half of the ad was cut off and they forgot the ones where they'd seen the full ad and the ending. What's more, memory for specifics of unfinished ads was evident not only immediately, but two days later and sometimes even two weeks later, demonstrating the power that a bit of curiosity can cause. And I think this is especially interesting because conventional wisdom would say if you see more of something, 30 seconds of something, you're more likely to remember it than if you see 25 seconds of something. But According to this, that's not true. Sam Tatum, in his book Evolutionary Ideas, shares how products have used the curiosity gap to boost sales. For example, Pringles' brilliantly named WTF, what the flavour, hid critical product and flavour information from their audience. These what the flavour Pringle tubes created a frustrating and intriguing itch that needed to be scratched. People were desperate to know what flavour the Pringle was and flocked to buy more to see what flavours they would get. In 2020, in similar fashion, Mattel launched Colour Reveal Barbie. And this was a, was a very special edition of the Barbie doll, where each doll's look remained a complete mystery until the doll was bought and revealed. 
So the doll would arrive in this futuristic tube and each Barbie started looking bubblegum pink until the Barbie was basically submerged into a tube filled with water where then the skin colour, the makeup and the dress of the Barbie would be unveiled. Adding these metaphorical cliffhangers to your product can boost sales, it can boost sign-up rates and it draws in attention and approves recall. There's no end to the evidence that suggests that. However, this is Nudge, and on Nudge, I'm not just about sharing studies and leaving it at that. No, I want to test this stuff out for myself. I wanted to see if the curiosity gap would attract listeners to this show. So I ran an experiment, and I decided to run it on TikTok. I'd heard that TikTok was a great place to find listeners, so I decided to try and grow my following on there. Armed with some ad budget and my curiosity gap research, I started to create some videos. Now, I made two types of videos for this experiment. One type leveraged the curiosity gap within the first five seconds of the video. And the other videos, they didn't use the curiosity gap at all. These curiosity gap videos included this immediate cliffhanger designed to get people hooked on the video and keep them watching. Here's an example. Made a Reddit ad 45% more effective by adding one line of copy. Here's how. There's a bias called... So a pretty obvious curiosity gap there. The gap is what that line of copy is. Viewers want to know what the line of copy is, so they should keep watching the whole video. Here's another example of a curiosity gap video I created. It's one marketing tip that saved Aussies millions in late tax fines, but the tip is simpler than you might think. The Australian tax collectors... Have Now there's another layer of curiosity here. You not only want to know what the tip is, but you also want to know why it's simpler than you'd expect. And here's one more final example. There is a scientifically proven way to make people love what you create, and it might surprise you because it's completely irrational. In 2005, Andrew... Okay, this one is a bit of a Hail Mary. We're revving up the curiosity by telling people there's a way to make people love what you create, but it'll surprise you, and it's irrational. So lots of unknowns that you'd want to unpick there. Now I won't say that any of these videos are actually perfect, they're they're nowhere near that and there are far better examples of curiosity gap openers on other TikTok videos from better creators than me. But I wanted to test this out myself. So I created nine curiosity inspired TikTok videos and compared them to some other videos that didn't have curiosity gap openers. Videos like this. Your ideas aren't as unique as you think, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sam Tatum, in his book Evolutionary Ideas, talks about this fascinating... Now, this intro isn't awful. I still wanted people to watch the videos, after all. But there's no cliffhanger. It's just a statement. Your ideas aren't as unique as you think. It's missing that curiosity gap element. I created seven of these TikToks, each without the curiosity gap intro. Now, I didn't have any following out on TikTok at the time, so to get people to watch these videos, I needed to spend some ad money. For the test, I decided to spend $400. But to test which of the videos were effective, I decided to measure who went on to become a follower. The more people who watched the video and became a follower, the more successful I declared the video was. My thinking is, if you go on to follow a profile after you watch a video, it means A, you likely watched the whole video, so you were drawn in by the intro. And B, you probably liked the content and want more content like that. So I published all of my videos to TikTok and spent $400 promoting them. After thousands of impressions and 6,133 new followers, I had my results. Unsurprisingly, the Curiosity Gap videos were far more effective. People who watched those videos were 82% more likely to go on and become a follower compared to the non-Curiosity Gap videos. Because these videos were more effective, it also made it much cheaper for me to acquire followers. I was able to spend 50% less to gain a follower with the Curiosity Gap videos. One out of seven people who watched those videos would go on to become a follower. Whereas for the videos with the cliffhanger, it was one out of 13. Safe to say, this really works. Starting content with a cliffhanger will keep people watching. These videos have helped my TikTok account grow to 11,000 followers with 23,000 likes and 850,000 views. And I think this is a lesson for anyone creating content or anyone writing a message that you want people to read, whether that's an email, a pitch, or a blog. Use the curiosity gap. Share something surprising at the start and make viewers curious about the answer. 
Now, I couldn't do a whole episode myself on the curiosity gap without inspiring a bit of curiosity in you. So if you are interested in learning more about the one line of copy that improved my Reddit ad by 15%, the one I tested, the one I teased in that TikTok video earlier, then make sure you listen to my full episode on that exact topic. I've left a link to that episode in the show notes. You can find it there. It is called How I Improved a Reddit Ad by 15% using a magic trick. And it's well worth a listen. If you like this style of podcast where I run these tests and share the results, you'll love that episode. So go and give it a listen. You'll also probably love episodes 67, 68, 69, and 70 of Nudge. Each of those episodes contain tests that I ran to measure the effectiveness of all types of nudges. You'll learn how I got hundreds of five-star reviews on this podcast and why I told 10,000 people not to listen to this show. It's it is well worth a listen. As always, please go and sign up to my newsletter. You'll get a weekly psychology-inspired tip, including why green number plates can boost e-car sales. And of course, you'll get a reminder every time a new episode of Nudge goes live. The link to that is in the show notes. If anyone is counting, I use the curiosity gap at least three times in this outro. So I'm definitely practicing what I preach, but I'd still love to hear what you think or how you've used it before. So get in touch with me on LinkedIn. I'm Phil Agnew on there, or tweet me at P underscore Agnew. That's P underscore A-G-N-E-W. As always, thank you so much for listening and join me again next week for another episode of Nudge.